Hello our dear viewers. Before we begin I'd like to thank you for your continued support. As you know, we strive to provide valuable content without bothering you with ads. But to continue we need your support. If you enjoy this video, all we ask is that you click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and activate the bell icon to receive notifications. If you have any comments or suggestions, don't hesitate to share them with us in the comments section. Your engagement is what drives us to continue and helps us reach a wider audience. Thank you and now let's begin. The summer of 2008 was etched in my memory, a time when the world seemed both vast and intimate. I was just a child then, wide-eyed and curious, with Europe as my playground. Our family, consisting of my parents and me, along with our two loyal canine companions, had always been adventurers at heart. Every summer, we'd pack our car to the brim with essentials and set off on journeys that would become the stories of our lives. That particular year, our compass pointed towards Luxembourg, a gem nestled in the heart of Western Europe. It was a country I'd only seen in atlases, its borders embraced by Belgium, Germany, and France. As we crossed into Luxembourg, I pressed my face against the car window, marveling at how the landscape transformed. Gone were the flat expanses I was accustomed to. In their place rose a terrain of undulating hills and mysterious forests. My father, a man with salt and pepper hair and a penchant for spontaneity, was at the wheel. His eyes sparkled with excitement as he navigated the winding roads. You see, son, he'd say, his voice carrying over the hum of the engine. Luxembourg may be small, but it's got a big heart. And mountains. Did you know that? I shook my head, absorbing this new information like a sponge. My mother, seated beside him, would chime in with fascinating tidbits from the guidebook spread across her lap. Her auburn hair caught the sunlight filtering through the trees, creating a halo effect that made her look almost magical. As we drove deeper into the country, the mountains began to make their presence known. They weren't the towering giants of the Alps, but rather proud, ancient guardians of the land. Their slopes were cloaked in dense forests, occasionally parting to reveal charming villages or solitary castles perched on rocky outcrops. Our dogs, Max and Luna, a pair of energetic golden retrievers, whined softly from the back seat, eager for their next adventure. I patted their heads, sharing in their anticipation. The car was filled with the scent of the picnic my mother had packed, fresh bread, local cheeses, and the promise of sweet pastries for dessert. As the day wore on, the familiar gave way to the unknown. We had long since left the main roads, following smaller paths that snaked through the countryside. The paved surfaces gradually turned to gravel, then to dirt tracks barely wide enough for our vehicle. Let's explore here, my father suddenly announced, pulling the car to a stop at a seemingly random spot along the road. It was a decision that would change everything. We stepped out of the car, stretching our legs after hours of driving. The air was different here, crisp and laden with the scent of pine and wild herbs. Max and Luna bounded out, their tails wagging furiously as they investigated this new territory. Across the road from where we had parked loomed an imposing sight. It was a wall of rock, smooth and formidable, rising at least as high as a two-story house. The top was crowned with trees, their roots somehow finding purchase in the seemingly impenetrable stone. But what caught my eye was a huge crack that ran down the middle of this natural fortress, splitting it in two. Look there, my mother pointed, her keen eyes spotting a detail I had missed. At the base of the crack, barely visible, was a crude stairway carved into the rock. It led upwards, disappearing into the shadows between the two halves of the mountain. A shiver ran down my spine, despite the warmth of the summer day. I had always been sensitive to the unseen, a trait that had led to several unsettling encounters in the past. Ghosts, spirits, or whatever you might call them. I had felt their presence before. Each time it left me with an uneasy feeling, a creeping sensation that I was unwelcome, 
an intruder in spaces not meant for the living. As we approached the base of the rock face, that familiar feeling began to stir in the pit of my stomach. Yet curiosity overrode my apprehension. My father, ever the explorer, was already examining the rock stairway, testing its stability with his foot. It seems solid enough, he declared, his voice echoing slightly in the confines of the crack. Shall we see where it leads? My mother nodded enthusiastically, already reaching for her camera. She had a passion for photography, always seeking to capture the essence of our travels. The dogs, sensing adventure, barked in agreement. With a deep breath, I followed my parents into the crack. The temperature dropped noticeably as we entered the shadow of the mountain. The walls on either side were close enough that I could touch both simultaneously if I stretched out my arms. Water trickled down in places, creating dark streaks on the rock face. As we ascended the crude steps, the feeling of unease grew stronger. It was as if unseen eyes were watching our every move, judging our intrusion. I wanted to tell my parents, to ask if we could turn back, but the words stuck in my throat. And then, about halfway up the stairs, I saw her. At first I thought it was a trick of the light, a ray of sunshine somehow finding its way through the crack above. But as I blinked and focused, the image before me solidified into something both beautiful and terrifying. She stood on one of the higher steps, her form translucent yet radiant. It was as if she was made of pure light, with a soft orange glow emanating from her core. Her features were indistinct, but I could make out the curve of a smile and the gentle wave of a hand beckoning us forward. Mom, I whispered, my voice trembling. Do you see her? My mother, who had been a few steps ahead, turned back. Her eyes widened as they fell upon the apparition. Without a word, she raised her camera and snapped a picture. The flash illuminated the narrow space for a split second, and in that moment, the ghostly figure seemed to shimmer and become even more defined. My father, who had been leading our ascent, hadn't noticed our pause. Come on, you two, he called back, his voice echoing off the rock walls. We're almost at the top. The ghost, for I was certain now that's what she was, continued to smile and wave. Despite every instinct telling me to turn and run, I found myself drawn towards her. It was as if she was pulling me forward with an invisible thread. Step by step, I approached. The air around her was different, warmer, almost comforting. As I drew level with her, I could feel the heat radiating from her form, as tangible as the body heat of another person. It enveloped me, and for a moment all my fear melted away. Then, in an instant, I passed through her. The warmth vanished, replaced by a chill that seeped into my bones. I gasped, spinning around, but the apparition had vanished. Did you see that? I asked my mother, my voice a mix of awe and fear. She nodded slowly, her face pale. I... I think I got it on camera, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. We hurried to catch up with my father, who had reached the top of the stairs. As we emerged from the crack, we found ourselves on a small plateau, surrounded by dense forest. The trees here were old, their gnarled branches reaching out like arthritic fingers. My father, oblivious to what had just transpired, was already exploring the area. There's another path here, he called out pointing to a narrow trail that led deeper into the woods. My mother, still shaken by our encounter, suggested we take a break. We sat on some fallen logs, the dogs settling at our feet. As my parents unpacked our picnic, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. As we ate our lunch, the forest around us seemed to come alive. Birds called to each other in the canopy above, their songs intertwining in a complex melody. A gentle breeze rustled the leaves, carrying with it the scent of wild mushrooms and damp earth. I tried to focus on my sandwich, but my mind kept replaying the encounter with the ghostly woman. Had she been trying to tell us something? Warn us? Or was she simply a remnant of a long-forgotten past, doomed to replay her final moments for eternity? 
My mother, sensing my unease, placed a comforting hand on my shoulder. Are you all right, sweetheart? She asked, her eyes filled with concern. I nodded, not trusting my voice. How could I explain the mixture of fear and fascination I felt? How could I put into words the warmth of the ghost's embrace or the chill that followed? As if in response to my thoughts, a sudden gust of wind swept through our little clearing. It was unnaturally cold for a summer day, carrying with it whispers that seemed just on the edge of comprehension. Max and Luna whined, pressing closer to us. My father, ever the pragmatist, attributed it to the peculiar geography of the area. Mountain weather, he said with a shrug. It can change in an instant. But I knew better. This was no ordinary wind. It carried with it the weight of history, of lives lived and lost on this ancient mountain. As we finished our meal and packed away the remnants, my father's adventurous spirit reasserted itself. Shall we explore that other path? He suggested, pointing to the trail he had spotted earlier. My mother hesitated, glancing at me. I could see the conflict in her eyes, the desire to unravel the mysteries of this place warring with her maternal instinct to protect me from the unknown. In the end, curiosity won out. We set off down the narrow trail, the dogs leading the way, their noses to the ground as they investigated every new scent. The path wound its way through the dense forest, occasionally offering glimpses of the valley below through gaps in the trees. As we walked, the whispers I had heard earlier seemed to grow stronger. They were coming from all around us now, a cacophony of voices just below the threshold of understanding. Suddenly, Max and Luna stopped in their tracks, their ears perked and tails rigid. A low growl rumbled in Max's throat. What is it, boy? My father asked, peering into the gloom ahead. As if in answer, the whispers coalesced into a single, clear voice. Turn back, it said, the words carried on the wind. This place is not for the living. My mother's face paled at the ethereal warning her hand instinctively reaching for mine. My father, however, seemed more intrigued than frightened. His eyes scanned the forest around us, searching for the source of the voice. Did you hear that? I whispered, my voice barely audible over the rustling of leaves. My mother nodded slowly, her grip on my hand tightening. Maybe we should head back, she suggested, her voice trembling slightly. But my father was already moving forward, his curiosity overriding any sense of caution. It's probably just the wind playing tricks on us, he said, though his voice lacked its usual confidence. Come on, let's see where this path leads. Reluctantly, we followed him deeper into the forest. The trees seemed to close in around us, their branches reaching out like gnarled fingers, obscuring what little sunlight managed to penetrate the canopy. The air grew colder with each step, and a fine mist began to swirl around our feet. The dogs whined softly, staying close to our heels rather than ranging ahead as they usually did. Their unease only added to the growing sense of dread that had settled in the pit of my stomach. After what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes, the path opened up into a small clearing. What we saw there made us all stop in our tracks. Oh my God, my mother breathed her free hand flying to her mouth in shock. Before us lay a forgotten graveyard, its weathered tombstones tilting at odd angles, half swallowed by the encroaching forest. Moss and lichen covered most of the stones, obscuring the names and dates carved into them. In the center of the clearing stood a crumbling mausoleum, its once grand facade now a shadow of its former glory. My father approached one of the nearest graves brushing away the moss to reveal the inscription beneath. These dates, some of these are hundreds of years old, he said, his voice filled with wonder. As he spoke, the mist seemed to thicken, swirling around the graves in an almost purposeful manner. The whispers returned, louder now, a chorus of voices that seemed to emanate from the very ground beneath our feet. We shouldn't be here, I said, tugging on my mother's hand. We need to leave. But even as the words left my mouth, I saw something that made my blood run cold. 
Standing in the doorway of the mausoleum was the glowing figure we had encountered earlier. Her orange light seemed dimmer now, tinged with sadness. She raised a translucent hand, beckoning us forward. My father, following my gaze, saw her too. Incredible, he murmured, already taking a step towards the mausoleum. No! I cried out, but it was too late. As soon as my father's foot touched the threshold of the mausoleum, the world around us seemed to shift. The mist thickened instantly, obscuring everything beyond a few feet. The whispers grew to a deafening roar, and I felt as if I was being pulled in a thousand different directions at once. I clung to my mother's hand, terrified of being separated in this supernatural maelstrom. When the mist finally cleared, the world around us had changed. Gone was the decrepit graveyard, replaced by a bustling village square. The mausoleum had transformed into a grand church, its spire reaching towards a sky that was no longer obscured by trees. People in old-fashioned clothing hurried about their business, paying us no mind. What... what happened? My mother asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Where are we? My father... His face a mask of awe and confusion shook his head. Not where, he said slowly. When? I think we've somehow traveled back in time. As impossible as it seemed, I knew he was right. The sights, sounds, and even smells around us were from a different era entirely. The dogs, still by our side, whined in confusion, pressing close to our legs. Before we could fully process what had happened, a commotion near the church caught our attention. A group of villagers had gathered, their voices raised in anger. At the center of the crowd stood a young woman, her clothes tattered and her face streaked with tears. Witch! One of the villagers cried out, pointing an accusing finger at the woman. She's brought nothing but misfortune to our village. With a start, I realized that the accused woman was a younger version of the ghostly figure we had encountered. Her eyes, filled with fear and desperation, scanned the crowd, finally landing on us. For a moment our gazes locked, and I felt a jolt of recognition pass between us. Please, she called out, her voice carrying clearly despite the angry shouts around her. I'm not a witch. I only wanted to help. But her pleas fell on deaf ears. The crowd surged forward, rough hands grabbing at her clothes and hair. My father made a move as if to intervene but my mother held him back. We can't, she hissed. We don't know what consequences our actions might have. Forced to watch helplessly, we saw the woman dragged towards a pyre that had been hastily assembled near the church. As the flames were lit, her eyes found mine once more. In that moment, I felt a wave of emotions that were not my own, fear, sadness, but also a desperate hope. The scene before us began to shimmer and fade, the woman's anguished cries echoing in our ears as the mist enveloped us once more. With centuries of sorrow locked onto ours, when she spoke her voice was a whisper on the wind, yet we heard it clearly. You have seen the truth, she said. You now carry the burden of my story. My father, ever the diplomat, stepped forward. We want to help he said. Tell us how. The ghost's form flickered like a candle in a breeze. My name was Elise, she began. I was a healer, using the knowledge of plants and nature to cure ailments. But fear and ignorance turned my neighbors against me. They branded me a witch and took my life. As she spoke, the air around us seemed to thicken with emotion. I could feel her pain, her frustration, and her longing for justice. All I ask is that my story be told, Elise continued, that the truth of what happened here not be lost to time. My mother, who had been quiet until now, spoke up. We'll do more than that, she said, her voice firm with resolve. We'll clear your name. The next morning, we found ourselves in the local library of the nearest town. The librarian, an elderly woman named Margot, looked at us curiously as we explained our interest in the area's history, particularly focusing on witch trials. Ah, she said, her eyes lighting up. You must have visited the old graveyard in the forest, 
Not many tourists find that place. As Margot led us through the stacks, pulling out dusty tomes and faded manuscripts, we began to piece together the history of the region. The 17th century had been a time of great upheaval, with superstition and fear running rampant. There were several witch trials during that period, Margot explained, pointing to a particularly grim account. But one case always stood out to me. A young woman named Elise, known for her healing abilities. The records show she was accused of witchcraft after a bad harvest and a bout of illness in the village. My father leaned in, his eyes scanning the ancient text. Does it say anything about the evidence against her? Margot shook her head. That's the curious thing. The records are frustratingly vague. It's as if someone wanted to obscure the details. As we delved deeper into the research, a pattern began to emerge. Elise had been popular among the common folk, her remedies often more effective than those of the official town physician. This had not sat well with some of the more powerful members of the community. Look at this, my mother said, pointing to a faded letter she had discovered. It's from the town physician to the magistrate. He's complaining about losing patience to a common hedge witch. The pieces were starting to fall into place. Elise hadn't been a witch at all, but a victim of jealousy and political maneuvering. Armed with our newfound knowledge, we approached the local historical society. At first they were skeptical of our claims, but as we presented the evidence we had uncovered, their interest grew. This could change our understanding of that entire period, the society's president, Dr. Fournier, said as he poured over our notes. If what you're saying is true, Elise's case could be a key to re-examining other witch trials in the region. Over the next few days, our quiet family vacation turned into a full-fledged historical investigation. My parents threw themselves into the research, coordinating with Dr. Fournier and his team. I found myself acting as a bridge between the present and the past, my sensitivity to the supernatural providing insights that the historians might have otherwise missed. As word of our investigation spread, more people came forward with family stories and heirlooms. A descendant of the town's former magistrate provided a diary that corroborated our theories about the political motivations behind Elise's trial. The ghost of Elise herself seemed to gain strength as we uncovered more of the truth. Her appearances became more frequent, and each time she seemed more at peace. Two weeks after our fateful hike in the woods, we stood once again in the old graveyard, but this time we weren't alone. A crowd had gathered, historians, local officials, and curious townspeople. Dr. Fournier stood at the front, addressing the assembled group. Thanks to the tireless efforts of this family, he said, gesturing to us, we have uncovered a great injustice of our past. Elise was not a witch, but a healer, wrongly accused and convicted. Today, we set the record straight. As he spoke, a team began the work of restoring Elise's grave, which had been unmarked for centuries. A new headstone was placed, bearing her name and the truth of her story. As the ceremony concluded, I felt a familiar warmth beside me. Elise's spectral form appeared, more vibrant than ever before. Her face bore a smile of profound relief and gratitude. Thank you, she said, her voice carrying on the wind. You have freed me. With those words, her form began to fade, not into nothingness, but into a soft golden light that seemed to permeate the entire graveyard. As the light dissipated, I felt a sense of peace settle over the area, as if a great wrong had finally been righted. On our last night in Luxembourg, we sat around the campfire, reflecting on the extraordinary events of the past few weeks. What had started as a simple family vacation had turned into a life-changing adventure. I never thought I'd be part of uncovering a historical injustice, my father mused, poking at the fire with a stick. My mother nodded, her eyes distant. It makes you wonder how many other stories like Elise's are out there, waiting to be told. As for me, I found myself grappling with my newfound understanding of my sensitivity to the supernatural. 
It wasn't a curse or something to be feared, but a gift that could bridge the gap between past and present, between the seen and unseen worlds. What do we do now? I asked, voicing the question that had been on all our minds. My parents exchanged a look. Well, my father said slowly, Dr. Fournier mentioned that there are similar cases in other parts of Europe. He suggested we might want to look into them. A thrill of excitement ran through me. The idea of more adventures, more mysteries to solve, more wrongs to right. It was both terrifying and exhilarating. So this is just the beginning? I asked, unable to keep the eagerness out of my voice. My mother smiled, reaching out to squeeze my hand. If that's what you want, sweetheart, we could make it a family mission. As we sat there planning our next adventure, I realized that our encounter with Elise had changed us all. We had set out to explore the world, but in the process, we had discovered a calling to be the voice for those long silenced by history. The morning of our departure dawned bright and clear. As we packed up our car, the weight of our experiences settled around us like a comfortable cloak. We were no longer just tourists, but guardians of forgotten truths. Before leaving, we made one last trip to the graveyard. Standing before Elise's restored headstone, we each took a moment to say our private goodbyes. As I placed my hand on the cool stone, I felt a gentle warmth, a final acknowledgement from Elise. As we drove away from Luxembourg, the road stretching out before us seemed to hold infinite possibilities. My father had already begun researching our next destination, a small town in the Black Forest of Germany with its own tales of misunderstood witches. Looking out the window at the passing landscape, I reflected on how much had changed in just a few short weeks. We had come to Luxembourg as a normal family on vacation and were leaving as something else entirely, historians, investigators, and protectors of long-buried truths. The sun was high in the sky as we crossed the border into Germany. As the familiar excitement of a new adventure began to build, I realized that our true journey was just beginning. There were more stories to uncover, more wrongs to right, and more connections to be made between the past and the present. And as our car wound its way through the European countryside, I knew that wherever our path led us next, we would face it together. A family bound not just by blood, but by a shared mission to give voice to the voiceless and to shine a light on the shadows of history. Years have passed since that fateful summer in Luxembourg. What began as a chance encounter has blossomed into a lifelong pursuit. Our family has traveled across Europe, uncovering forgotten stories and bringing long buried truths to light. Each case we investigate, each spirit we help to find peace, adds another thread to the rich tapestry of our shared history. We've learned that the past is never truly gone. It lives on in the stones of ancient buildings, in the whispers of the wind, and in the memories of those who have long since left this world. Our work has not always been easy. We've faced skepticism, opposition, and sometimes danger. But we've also found allies in the most unexpected places. Historians eager for new perspectives, local communities rediscovering their heritage, and even descendants of those involved in past injustices seeking to make amends. As for me, my sensitivity to the supernatural has grown stronger with each passing year. I have learned to use it not just to communicate with spirits, but to read the emotional imprints left on places and objects. It's a gift that continues to guide us in our quest for truth. Tonight, as I write these words, we're camped at the edge of a forest in rural Romania. Tomorrow, we'll begin investigating reports of a shepherdess from the 18th century, wrongly accused of bringing a curse upon her village. Her story, like so many others, waits to be told. And so, our journey continues. With each story we uncover, each name we restore, we weave a connection between past and present, between the living and the dead. In doing so, we've discovered that history is not a fixed narrative, but a living, breathing entity that changes as we engage with it. 
As I close my journal and prepare for sleep, I can feel the whispers of the past swirling around our campsite. They no longer fill me with fear, but with a sense of purpose. For in listening to these long-silenced voices, in bringing their stories to light, we do more than correct historical records. We restore the humanity that was taken from them. And in this work, I found my calling. For as long as there are untold stories and unresolved injustices echoing through time, our family will be there, ready to listen, to understand and to share these tales with the world. Last Sunday I decided to go on a camping trip with my friends to the dense cedar forest, located two hours away from our city. I was very excited about this adventure, as it was an opportunity to escape from work pressures and daily life. I packed everything I needed, a tent, sleeping bag, food, water, and of course my mobile phone to take pictures and send updates to my family. I promised my little sister Sarah that I would send her daily video updates about my trip. On Monday morning I set off with my three friends, Jake, Mike, and Tom. The trip was fun. We exchanged stories and jokes all the way. We arrived at the edge of the forest in the afternoon and started our journey on foot towards the campsite we had chosen. The view was stunning. Giant cedar trees surrounded us on all sides and the fresh air filled our lungs. I felt relaxed and at peace as I walked amidst this enchanting nature. After two hours of walking, we reached the campsite. It was a beautiful spot next to a small stream. We set up our tents and lit a fire to cook dinner. We sat around the fire exchanging stories and laughing until late at night. Before going to sleep, I sent a short video to my sister Sarah, telling her about our first day and how wonderful it was. I promised her more updates in the coming days. I woke up on Tuesday morning to the sound of birds and the gurgling of water. It was another beautiful day. We spent the day exploring the area surrounding the campsite. We found a small waterfall and swam in the cold pool beneath it. In the evening, I sent another update to Sarah, but I noticed that the phone signal was very weak. I told myself I would try to send more updates tomorrow when we moved to another area. Wednesday was different. We woke up to the sound of thunder. The sky was overcast with dark clouds. We decided to stay at the camp instead of exploring. I tried to send a message to Sarah, but there was no signal at all. It started raining heavily in the afternoon. We had to stay inside the tents. The atmosphere was gloomy and tense. I felt worried about not being able to communicate with my family, but I tried to reassure myself that everything would be okay. But things were not okay. In the middle of the night, we woke up to a terrifying scream. It was Jake's voice. We got out of our tents to find him, but he had disappeared. We searched everywhere around the camp, but found no trace of him. We spent the rest of the night in a state of fear and anxiety. We couldn't sleep. We kept hearing strange sounds coming from the forest, sounds we hadn't heard before. Heavy footsteps, deep breaths, and sometimes what sounded like a faint roar. As the sun rose, we decided to leave the camp and return to the city. We were scared and confused. We started packing our things quickly, but suddenly we heard another scream. This time it was Mike's scream. We ran towards the source of the sound, but all we found were strange footprints on the muddy ground. They were very large, bigger than anything we had seen before, and there was a trace of a heavy body being dragged on the ground. Now only Tom and I were left. We were terrified. We tried to call the police, but there was no signal. We decided to try to reach the edge of the forest as quickly as possible. We started walking, trying to follow the path we came from. But the forest looked different now. The trees seemed denser, the shadows deeper. We felt as if the forest itself was trying to prevent us from leaving. After hours of walking, we realized we had lost our way. We were in a part of the forest we hadn't seen before. The trees here were gigantic and there was a thick fog covering the ground. Suddenly we heard a sound from afar. 
It sounded like a human voice calling. We thought it might be Jake or Mike. We ran towards the source of the sound, ignoring the fear that filled our hearts. But what we found wasn't what we expected. We reached the edge of a rocky cliff, and at the bottom we saw something we couldn't believe. There was a huge creature, standing on two legs like a human, but much taller and larger. Its body was covered with thick fur, and its head resembled that of a deer, but with larger and more complex antlers. The creature was standing next to a large cave, and on the ground in front of it, we saw bodies, human bodies. I felt sick as I realized these bodies might be our missing friends. Before we could move, the creature turned towards us. Its large yellow eyes met mine, and I felt terror freeze the blood in my veins. It let out a terrifying roar and started climbing the cliff towards us. Tom screamed, run, and we started running as fast as we could. We ran through the forest, branches scratching our faces and arms. We could hear the creature behind us getting closer and closer. Suddenly Tom stumbled and fell. I turned to help him, but he shouted at me to keep running. That was the last thing I heard from him. I continued running, tears filling my eyes and Tom's screams filling my ears. I don't know how long I ran. All I know is that I finally found myself at the edge of the forest. I saw the road and my car in the distance. I ran towards it, my heart pounding heavily. I reached the car and jumped inside. I started the engine and drove off at full speed. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw a huge shadow standing at the edge of the forest, watching me as I drove away. Now, as I sit in the police station trying to explain what happened, they don't believe me. They say it might have been a bear or that I was hallucinating due to stress and fear. But I know what I saw. I know there's something in that forest something that can't be explained. I don't know what I'll do now. How will I tell my friends' families what happened? How will I live with these memories? All I know is that I will never return to that forest again. And I hope that creature stays there, away from our world. But deep in my heart, I fear it might not stay there. I fear it might come out someday. And then, I don't know what will happen to our world. Days passed since my return from the forest, but I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that terrifying creature and the faces of my missing friends. The police started a search in the forest, but they found no trace of my friends or the creature I described. One night as I was trying to sleep, I heard a strange sound outside my window. It sounded like the heavy footsteps I had heard in the forest. I jumped out of my bed, my heart pounding. I looked out the window but saw nothing but darkness. The next day I decided to go to the local library to search for any information about strange creatures in the area. I spent hours flipping through old books and local legends. I found some stories about a creature called Wendigo, a mythical being from Native American folklore. The description was similar to what I had seen, but I wasn't sure. While I was deep in reading, I noticed an old man watching me. He approached and asked what I was looking for. When I told him, he looked concerned. He said, son, some secrets should remain buried, but if you're determined to know more, there's someone you should meet. The old man gave me an address for a cabin on the outskirts of town. He said the cabin's owner was called Uncle Joe, and he was a Native American who knew a lot about the area's history and secrets. The next day, I went to the cabin. It was a simple place surrounded by trees. I knocked on the door, and after a moment, an old man with a wrinkled face and a sharp gaze opened it. You're the young man who saw the Wendigo, aren't you? He asked me directly. I was surprised that he knew the reason for my visit. Uncle Joe invited me in and began to tell an old story. Hundreds of years ago, this land was sacred to our people but strangers came and cut down the trees and built their cities. Nature became angry, and the ancient spirits awakened. The Wendigo is the embodiment of this anger. He told me that the Wendigo appears every few decades, takes some victims, then disappears again. But this time is different, Uncle Joe said with concern. 
It's getting closer to the town. The forest is shrinking, and the Wendigo feels threatened. It's looking for a new place. I asked him what I could do. He looked at me with sad eyes and said, Son, you're now part of this. The Wendigo saw you and let you live. This means it chose you for a reason. I felt terror coursing through my body. What does that mean? I asked with a trembling voice. It means you're the only one who can stop it. You must return to the forest. You must find the cave you saw and destroy it. That's where the Wendigo draws its power from. I left Uncle Joe's cabin feeling confused and scared. How could I return to that terrible place? How could I face that creature again? That night, I woke up to the sound of screaming. It was coming from the street. I looked out the window and saw my neighbor running down the street, screaming that a monster had attacked his son. I felt panic fill me. The Wendigo had started attacking the town. I realized I had no other choice. I had to go back to the forest. I had to stop this nightmare. The next morning I packed some equipment, a flashlight, rope, knife, and some food and water. Before I left I remembered something Uncle Joe had said. I went to the local herb shop and bought some herbs he said might help protect me. I reached the edge of the forest at noon. I stood there for a while trying to gather my courage. Then slowly I began to enter between the trees. The forest was unnaturally quiet. I couldn't hear any birds or animals. The air was heavy and humid. I walked for hours, trying to remember the way to the cave. As the sun set, I began to feel desperate. I was lost and didn't know where I was going. Suddenly, I heard a voice from afar. It sounded like Jake, my missing friend. Jake? I called out. There was no response, but I heard the voice again, this time closer. I started running towards the source of the sound, ignoring my mind's warning that this could be a trap. I reached an open area in the forest, and there in the middle of the clearing, I saw it. The Wendigo was standing there, tall and terrifying as I remembered it. But this time it was looking directly at me, as if it had been waiting for me. I felt paralyzed with fear. I wanted to run, but my feet refused to move. The Wendigo started approaching me slowly. Each step shook the ground. Suddenly I remembered the herbs I had bought. With a trembling hand, I took them out of my bag and threw them towards the creature. Something strange happened. The Wendigo started to retreat, as if the smoke rising from the herbs was hurting it. I took this opportunity and ran. I ran like I had never run before. I heard the Wendigo roar behind me, but I didn't stop. After what seemed like hours, I reached a rocky slope, and there I saw the entrance to the cave. I quickly entered the cave, my heart pounding hard. The place was dark and damp. I turned on my flashlight and looked around. The cave walls were covered with strange drawings and ancient marks. Deep in the cave I found a large room, and in its center there was a large stone inscribed with strange symbols. I felt a strange energy emanating from the stone. Suddenly I heard the Wendigo's voice approaching. I had no time to think. I took out the knife and started carving into the symbols on the stone, trying to destroy them. With each symbol I destroyed, I felt the cave shake. I heard the Wendigo's scream getting closer and closer. I continued carving with all my strength. Finally, with the last symbol I destroyed, there was an explosion of light. I felt a wave of energy rush through the cave. I heard the Wendigo's scream, but it was different this time. It was a scream of pain and defeat. Suddenly silence prevailed. I slowly left the cave, afraid of what I might see, but the forest was quiet. There was no trace of the Wendigo. I returned to town exhausted and confused. I wasn't sure exactly what had happened, or if the Wendigo had really disappeared. In the following weeks, there were no more attacks. Life slowly began to return to normal. But I didn't forget what happened. Every night, I dreamed of the forest, the cave, and the Wendigo. And on some nights, when I look out my window towards the distant forest, I wonder, is it really over? Or is the Wendigo still out there, waiting, watching, ready to return someday?
I don't know the answer. All I know is that I will never forget what happened in that forest, and that I will always be ready in case the Wendigo returns someday. Months passed, and life in our small town seemed to return to normal. The disappearances of Jake, Mike, and Tom were still unsolved mysteries, but people had started to move on. I, however, couldn't shake off the memories of what I'd seen in the forest. One day I received a call from an unknown number. When I answered, I heard a familiar voice. It was Uncle Joe. You need to come to the cabin, he said urgently. There's something you must know. I drove to Uncle Joe's cabin that evening, my mind racing with possibilities. When I arrived, I found him sitting on his porch, looking more worried than ever. It's not over, he said as soon as I approached. The Wendigo, it's evolving. Uncle Joe explained that he had been having visions, terrible nightmares of the Wendigo changing, growing stronger. The ritual you performed in the cave, he said, it didn't destroy the Wendigo, it forced it to adapt. He told me that the Wendigo was now able to take on human form. It could walk among us, undetected. But it still needs to feed, Uncle Joe warned, and it's hungry. As if to confirm his words, we heard a news report on the radio inside the cabin. There had been a gruesome murder in town, a body found mutilated in a way that the police couldn't explain. It's starting again, I whispered, feeling a chill run down my spine. Uncle Joe nodded gravely. You're connected to it now, he said. You're the only one who can sense its presence. You need to find it and stop it before it's too late. I left Uncle Joe's cabin with a heavy heart and a terrible responsibility. How was I supposed to find a creature that could look like anyone? Over the next few weeks, more mysterious deaths occurred in town. Each time I felt a strange sensation, a sort of tingling at the base of my skull. I realized this must be what Uncle Joe meant about sensing the Wendigo's presence. I started investigating each incident, following my instincts. I noticed patterns. The attacks always happened on nights with no moon, and always near wooded areas. One night, while I was staking out a park at the edge of town, I saw something that made my blood run cold. A figure emerged from the shadows, moving with an unnatural grace. At first glance, it looked human, but as it passed under a streetlight, I saw its eyes gleam with an eerie yellow light. I followed the figure my heart pounding. It led me to an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. As I watched, the figure's shape began to change, stretching and contorting until it once again resembled the monstrous Wendigo I had seen in the forest. I knew I had to act, but I felt woefully unprepared. Then I remembered the herbs that had helped me before. I had brought some with me just in case. I took them out, set them alight, and threw them into the warehouse. The effect was immediate. I heard an inhuman shriek of pain from inside. The Wendigo burst out of the warehouse, its human disguise gone, revealing its true, terrifying form. It saw me and roared in fury. I turned and ran, leading it away from the town and back towards the forest. I don't know how long I ran, but eventually I found myself back at the cave where this had all started. I dove inside, the Wendigo close behind. In the heart of the cave, I saw the stone with the symbols I had destroyed months ago. But now, new symbols were forming, glowing with an otherworldly light. I realized what I had to do. As the Wendigo entered the cave, I began to carve new symbols into the stone, symbols of protection that Uncle Joe had taught me. The Wendigo howled and charged at me, but with each symbol I completed, it seemed to grow weaker. Finally, as I finished the last symbol, there was a blinding flash of light. When my vision cleared, the Wendigo was gone. In its place was a swirling vortex of energy. Somehow I knew that this was a portal to the spirit world, where the Wendigo truly belonged. Without thinking, I reached out and touched the vortex. Immediately, I was overwhelmed with visions. I saw the history of the land, the anger of nature, the pain that had created the Wendigo, and I understood. 
When I came to, I was lying on the floor of the cave. The vortex was gone, and with it, the Wendigo. But I could feel that something had changed within me. I returned to town a different person. The killing stopped, and slowly life truly did return to normal. But I knew that my role as protector had just begun. Now, as I stand at the edge of the forest, I can feel the balance between our world and the spirit world. And I know that if that balance is ever threatened again, I'll be ready. The Wendigo taught me that there are forces in this world beyond our understanding. But it also taught me that with knowledge, courage, and compassion, even the most terrifying monsters can be overcome. As I turn back towards the town, I smile. The forest behind me whispers with secrets, but for now at least, those secrets are at peace. And so am I. I stood in the empty living room of my apartment, surrounded by a few cardboard boxes and a battered suitcase. The bare walls echoed with memories of happier times, now faded and bitter. Sunlight streamed through the naked windows, illuminating the dust moat swirling in the air. I took a deep breath, trying to steady my nerves. Well, whiskers, this is it, I said, glancing down at my feline companion. His one green eye fixed on me with an intensity that seemed to say, it's about time. He was curled up on top of a box labeled Art Supplies. His orange and white fur, a stark contrast against the brown cardboard. I knelt down to scratch behind his ears, feeling the rough texture of his fur beneath my fingertips. You're right, buddy. We should have done this a long time ago. As I stood up, my gaze fell on the small pile of possessions that represented my life. After years of marriage, supporting Jake's career and dreams, I was left with so little. A few boxes of clothes, some art supplies, and a handful of personal items. It was both liberating and terrifying. I picked up a framed photo from the top of a nearby box. It was a picture of Jake and me on our wedding day, both of us smiling brightly at the camera. I traced my finger along the edge of the frame, remembering the hope and love I had felt that day. With a sigh, I placed the photo face down in the box. Come on, Whiskers, I said, picking up the cat carrier. Time to go. Whiskers let out a disgruntled meow as I coaxed him into the carrier. He had never been fond of confinement, but I knew he'd settle down once we were on the road. I made one last sweep of the apartment, checking closets and drawers for anything I might have missed. In the bedroom, I paused at the sight of a small velvet box on the dresser. Inside was the engagement ring Jake had given me, its diamond catching the light. I considered taking it, but then I closed the box and left it where it was. Some things were better left behind. Back in the living room, I hefted two boxes, one stacked on top of the other, and made my way down to the rented moving truck parked outside. The summer heat hit me like a wall as I stepped out of the air-conditioned building. Sweat beaded on my forehead as I carefully navigated the steps down to the sidewalk. The truck looked impossibly large and empty as I slid open the back door. My meager possessions would barely fill a quarter of it. I arranged the boxes carefully, making sure nothing would shift during the long drive ahead. Trip after trip, I loaded my life into the truck. Whiskers watched from his carrier placed safely in the passenger seat of the cab. With each box, I felt a mixture of sadness and relief. This was the end of one chapter of my life, but also the beginning of another. As I placed the last box in the truck, I heard a familiar voice call out, Mia, is that you? I turned to see Mrs. Henderson, my elderly neighbor, peering at me from her porch next door. Her wispy white hair was pulled back in a loose bun, and she wore her usual floral housecoat. Hi, Mrs. Henderson, I said, forcing a smile. Yeah, it's me. I'm just moving out. Her eyes widened with concern. Oh dear, I had no idea. Are you and Jake? I nodded, not trusting myself to speak. Mrs. Henderson had always been kind to me, 
often inviting me over for tea and cookies when Jake was working late. She shuffled down her steps and across the small patch of grass separating our buildings. Before I knew it, she had enveloped me in a warm, grandmotherly hug. The scent of lavender and baking filled my nose, and I felt tears prick at the corners of my eyes. You take care of yourself, Mia, she said, patting my back. And remember, you're stronger than you know. I pulled back, wiping at my eyes. For everything. She smiled, her kind eyes crinkling at the corners. And don't you forget to call once you're settled. I want to hear all about your new adventures. I promised I would, then watched as she made her way back to her porch. With a final wave, I climbed into the driver's seat of the truck. Whiskers meowed softly from his carrier beside me. I know, buddy, I said, reaching over to stick my fingers through the grate. He rubbed his head against them, purring. I turned the key in the ignition, the engine rumbling to life. As I pulled away from the curb, I caught a glimpse of my reflection in the rearview mirror. My brown hair was pulled back in a messy ponytail, and there were dark circles under my eyes from nights of restless sleep. But there was something else there, too. A glimmer of hope, of possibility. The sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple as I guided the truck along the winding back roads. Twelve hours had passed since I'd left my old life behind, and the dense forests of North Carolina surrounded us on all sides. Whiskers dozed in his carrier, his soft snores, a comforting soundtrack to our journey. I glanced at the gas gauge, frowning at how low it had gotten. We should be getting close to Asheville, I muttered to myself, squinting to read the road signs in the fading light. The truck rumbled beneath me, the engine's steady hum, a constant companion. But as I rounded a particularly sharp bend, something changed. The engine sputtered, coughing like it was struggling to breathe. My heart leapt into my throat as I pressed down on the accelerator, willing the truck to keep going. No, 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 I pleaded. But it was no use. The engine gave one final wheeze and died completely. I coasted to a stop on the shoulder of the road, gravel crunching under the tires. Whiskers stirred in his carrier, letting out a questioning meow. I said, trying to keep the panic out of my voice, we've just hit a little snag. I turned the key in the ignition, but the engine refused to turn over. After a few more attempts, I slumped back in my seat, defeat washing over me. The forest loomed dark and imposing on either side of the road, and I suddenly felt very small and very alone. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I noticed something in the distance, a sign barely visible in the gloom. I squinted, trying to make out the words, Blackwood's Garage, I read aloud, half a mile ahead. Relief flooded through me. Maybe this wasn't a disaster after all. I turned to Whiskers, who was watching me intently through the carrier door. What do you think? Should we check it out? He meowed in response, which I chose to take his agreement. I grabbed my phone, using it as a flashlight, and climbed out of the truck. The night air was cool against my skin, a welcome change from the stuffy cab. Crickets chirped in the underbrush, and somewhere in the distance, an owl hooted. I retrieved Whiskers' carrier from the passenger seat, not wanting to leave him alone in the truck. Looks like we're walking, buddy, I said, locking the doors behind me. The road stretched out before us, a ribbon of darkness cutting through the trees. I set off at a brisk pace, Whiskers' carrier swinging gently at my side. Every rustle in the bushes made me jump, my imagination conjuring all sorts of creatures lurking just out of sight. As we walked, I couldn't help but think about how different this was from what I had planned. I was supposed to be arriving at my grandmother's cozy house in Asheville, not trudging down a dark road in the middle of nowhere. But then again, nothing about my life had gone according to plan lately. The half mile felt much longer in the dark, but finally I saw lights in the distance. The garage came into view an old-fashioned building with peeling paint and a rusted sign swinging in the breeze. But despite its run-down appearance, the sight of it filled me with hope. 
I approached the front door, my footsteps echoing in the quiet night. Just as I raised my hand to knock, Whiskers let out a low, warning growl. I paused, looking down at him in surprise. He was pressed against the back of his carrier, his fur standing on end. What's wrong, I asked, but he just continued to growl softly. I hesitated, my hand hovering inches from the door. Something about Whisker's reaction made me uneasy. But what choice did I have? We couldn't spend the night on the side of the road. Taking a deep breath, I steeled myself and knocked on the door. The sound echoed ominously in the night air, and I found myself holding my breath as I waited for a response. The knock echoed through the night, seeming to reverberate off the surrounding trees. For a long moment, there was only silence. Then a light flickered on inside the garage, casting long shadows across the gravel driveway. I heard shuffling footsteps approaching the door. My heart raced as the lock clicked and the door creaked open, revealing a wizened face peering out at me. Well, well, croaked an elderly woman, her silver hair tied back in a tight bun. What brings you to my doorstep at this hour, child? I'm so sorry to bother you, I said, shifting Whiskers' carrier to my other hand. My truck broke down about half a mile back, and I saw your sign. I was hoping you might be able to help. The woman's piercing blue eyes studied me for a moment before her face broke into a warm smile. Of course, dear. Can't leave you stranded out here in the dark, can we? I'm Miss Blackwood. She stepped back, gesturing for me to enter. As I crossed the threshold, the scent of motor oil and something herbal, lavender maybe, filled my nostrils. Thank you so much, I said, relief washing over me. I'm Mia, and this is Whiskers. Miss Blackwood peered at the carrier. Ah, a feline friend. How lovely. The interior of the garage was cluttered but clean, with tools neatly arranged on pegboards and various car parts stacked on shelves. In the corner, an old radio played soft jazz, the music tinny and slightly out of tune. Liam, Ethan, Miss Blackwood called out. We've got a customer. From the shadows at the back of the garage emerged two young men. The taller one with short dark hair and brooding eyes hung back, while the other blonde and strikingly handsome stepped forward with a charming smile. This is Mia, Miss Blackwood said. Her truck's broken down on the road. Liam, why don't you go take a look? Ethan can get her information. Liam nodded silently and grabbed a toolbox before heading out the door. Ethan approached me, his blue eyes twinkling in the fluorescent light. Let's get you sorted out, he said, his voice smooth as honey. Can you tell me what happened with your truck? As I explained the situation, Ethan jotted down notes on a clipboard. His presence was magnetic and I found myself drawn to his easy manner and quick smile. But every time he stepped closer, Whiskers let out a low, warning growl. Seems like your cat's not too fond of me, Ethan chuckled, keeping his distance. I'm sorry, I said, frowning at Whiskers' uncharacteristic behavior. He's usually not like this with strangers. Ethan shrugged it off, but I noticed a flicker of something. Annoyance? Concern? cross his face before his charming smile returned. As we finished up the paperwork, Whiskers suddenly lashed out, his paw darting through the carrier's grate to swat at Ethan's hand. Ethan jerked back, narrowly avoiding the cat's claws. Whiskers, I exclaimed, shocked. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's gotten into him. No harm done, Ethan said, but his smile seemed strained now. I should go check on Liam's progress. Excuse me. As Ethan disappeared into the night, I turned to Miss Blackwood, who had been watching the exchange with keen interest. I really am sorry about Whiskers, I said. He's never acted like this before. Miss Blackwood patted my arm, her touch surprisingly cold. Don't you worry, dear. Animals have a way of sensing things we can't. Now why don't you have a seat? This might take a while. I settled into a worn armchair, Whiskers' carrier at my feet. As Miss Blackwood bustled about making tea, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Whiskers' strange behavior, the isolated location of the garage, 
the odd dynamic between Miss Blackwood and her grandsons, it all added up to a sense of unease that I couldn't quite shake. As I settled into the worn armchair, Whisker's carrier nestled at my feet. Miss Blackwood bustled about preparing tea. The garage's interior was a curious mix of mechanical clutter and homey touches. A crocheted blanket draped over a workbench. Potted plants nestled between toolboxes. The soft jazz from the old radio provided a soothing backdrop, almost masking the unsettling quiet of the forest outside. Miss Blackwood returned, pressing a steaming mug into my hands. The warmth was comforting against my palms, and the herbal aroma helped ease some of the tension in my shoulders. Thank you, I said, taking a cautious sip. The tea was pleasantly bitter, with an unfamiliar earthy undertone. Miss Blackwood settled into a chair opposite me, her piercing blue eyes studying me over the rim of her own mug. So, Mia, she began, her voice carrying a hint of curiosity. What brings you to our neck of the woods? We don't get many travelers out this way, especially not at this hour. I hesitated, unsure how much to reveal. I'm starting over, I guess, moving to Asheville to stay with my grandmother for a while. Ah, new beginnings, Miss Blackwood nodded sagely. Always an adventure, but you do well to be careful in these parts, especially traveling alone. A chill ran down my spine, despite the warmth of the tea. What do you mean? Miss Blackwood leaned forward, her voice dropping to a near whisper. There's a curse on these woods, you know. Been here longer than any of us. The old-timers say it was placed by a vengeful spirit, wronged by early settlers. I forced a skeptical laugh, but it sounded hollow even to my own ears. A curse? Really? Oh, yes, Miss Blackwood continued, her eyes gleaming in the dim light. They say it preys on lone travelers, those who've lost their way. There have been over the years, folks who went into the forest and never came out. A shiver ran through me and I clutched my mug tighter. That's, that's just folklore, right? Old stories to keep kids from wandering off? Miss Blackwood shrugged, but there was a knowing look in her eyes. Perhaps, but there's often truth at the heart of such tales. Why just last month, a young man passing through vanished without a trace. His car was found abandoned on the road, not far from where your truck broke down. I swallowed hard, trying to ignore the way my heart had begun to race. That's terrible. Did they ever find him? No, Miss Blackwood said, shaking her head solemnly. Some say he fell victim to the curse. Others think he simply ran off starting a new life somewhere. But in these woods, well, it's best to stay vigilant. The garage door creaked open and I jumped, nearly spilling my tea. Liam entered, his expression unreadable as he wiped his hands on a greasy rag. How's it looking? I asked, eager for a change of subject. Liam shrugged. We'll need to order a new one. Won't be here till morning at the earliest. My heart sank. Oh, I... I see. The thought of spending the night here with Miss Blackwood's ominous words echoing in my mind filled me with dread. Don't you worry, dear, Miss Blackwood said, patting my knee. We've got a spare room upstairs. You can stay the night and we'll get you sorted first thing in the morning. I forced a smile, not wanting to seem ungrateful. That's very kind of you. As if sensing my unease, Whiskers let out a soft meow from his carrier. I reached down to scratch his ears through the grate, drawing comfort from his familiar presence. The door opened again and Ethan strode in, all easy smiles and charm. All squared away for the night, he asked, his gaze lingering on me a moment too long. I nodded, unable to shake the feeling of being watched, observed. Yes, thank you. You've all been so helpful. Well, I'd best be heading home, Ethan said, grabbing his jacket from a hook by the door. Early start tomorrow and all that? As he moved to leave, Liam stepped forward holding out a set of keys. Here, he said gruffly, addressing me for the first time, for your truck, so we can get started early. Our fingers brushed as I took the keys, and an inexplicable chill ran down my spine. 
Liam's eyes met mine for a brief moment, dark and unreadable, before he quickly looked away. My voice barely above a whisper. As Ethan left and Liam retreated to the back of the garage, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was missing something important. Miss Blackwood's tales of curses and disappearances swirled in my mind, mixing with the strange behavior of her grandsons and Whiskers' uncharacteristic aggression. I sipped the last of my now cold tea, trying to calm my nerves. It was just one night, I told myself. In the morning I'd be back on the road, leaving the strange encounter behind me. The fog rolled in thick and heavy as I guided the truck along the winding mountain road. Tendrils of mist crept across the asphalt, obscuring the yellow lines and blurring the edges of the forest. I leaned forward, squinting through the windshield as visibility dropped to mere feet in front of the hood. Just great, I muttered, easing my foot off the gas pedal. The last thing I needed was to run off the road in the soup. Whiskers stirred in his carrier on the passenger seat, letting out a low, plaintive meow. I glanced over, barely able to make out his silhouette through the mesh door. I know, buddy. I don't like this, either. As if in response to my words, Whiskers suddenly let out a sharp howl, his paw shooting out to bat at the carrier door. I jumped, startled by the sudden outburst. Whoa, easy there. I said, trying to keep my voice calm, despite the way my heart had leapt into my throat. What's got you so worked up? Whiskers continued to growl, a low rumbling sound I'd never heard from him before. His good eye gleamed in the dim light of the dashboard, fixed on something outside the passenger window. I peered into the mist, trying to see what had caught his attention. For a moment I thought I saw a flicker of movement in the trees lining the road, a darker shadow among the swirling gray, but as quickly as it appeared it was gone, swallowed up by the fog. A chill ran down my spine and I tightened my grip on the steering wheel. It's nothing, I said, as much to myself as to Whiskers, just tricks of the light, but Whiskers wasn't convinced. He paced restlessly in his carrier letting out occasional yowls that set my nerves on edge. I tried to focus on the road ahead, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The trees loomed on either side of the road, their branches reaching out like gnarled fingers through the mist. Shadows danced at the edge of my vision, always disappearing when I tried to look directly at them. Get it together, Mia, I muttered, shaking my head to clear it. There's nothing out there. But even as I said it, I wasn't sure I believed it. The fog seemed to press in closer, as if trying to smother us. The headlights barely penetrated the gloom, creating an eerie tunnel effect that made me feel like we were driving into the mouth of some great beast. More urgent this time. I glanced over to see him pressed against the back of his carrier, fur standing on end. What is it? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. What do you see? As if in answer, a dark shape darted across the road ahead, there and gone in an instant. I gasped, slamming on the brakes. The truck skidded slightly on the damp asphalt before coming to a stop. My heart pounded in my chest as I stared into the fog, trying to catch another glimpse of whatever it was. But there was nothing. Just the endless sea of gray. Whiskers growled low in his throat his eye fixed on the woods to our right. I followed his gaze, straining to see through the mist. For a moment I thought I saw a pair of gleaming eyes staring back at us from between the trees, but I blinked and they were gone. Okay, I said, my voice shaky. Okay, we're not stopping here. I eased my foot back onto the gas, the truck inching forward. Every shadow, every movement in the mist seemed to hide some unseen threat. I found myself holding my breath, waiting for something to leap out at us from the fog. But nothing did. We continued on, the only sounds the rumble of the engine and Whiskers' occasional growls. I tried to focus on the road, on getting us to Asheville in my grandmother's cabin, but I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being followed, watched by unseen eyes in the surrounding woods. The fog began to thin as we approached Asheville, 
wisps of mist dissipating to reveal glimpses of starry sky. I let out a long breath, feeling some of the tension ease from my shoulders. Whiskers, who had been restless and vocal for most of the journey, finally settled down in his carrier. Almost there, buddy, I murmured, glancing at the GPS on my phone. Just a few more miles. The winding mountain road gave way to more familiar territory as we neared the outskirts of town. Streetlights appeared, their warm glow a welcome sight after hours of driving through darkness. I navigated through quiet neighborhoods, following the directions to my grandmother's cabin. As the clock on the dashboard ticked over to midnight, I turned onto a narrow gravel road. Tall pines loomed on either side, their branches creating a canopy overhead that blocked out most of the moonlight. The truck's headlights cut through the darkness, illuminating the path ahead. After what felt like an eternity of bumping along the uneven road, a small clearing opened up before us. My grandmother's cabin sat nestled among the trees, its weathered wooden exterior barely visible in the dim light. I pulled up in front of the cabin and cut the engine. The sudden silence was almost deafening after hours of road noise. I sat for a moment, listening to the tick of the cooling engine and the soft rustle of wind through the trees, who blinked at me sleepily from his carrier. I grabbed my phone and the cabin keys from my bag, then reached for the door handle. As I was about to step out, a strange sound caught my attention. I froze, straining my ears. There it was again, a faint scratching noise coming from inside the truck. My heart began to race as I realized it wasn't coming from Whiskers' carrier on the passenger seat. The sound was behind me, in the covered bed of the truck. I turned slowly, peering into the darkness of the truck bed. The scratching grew louder, more insistent. Something was back there, moving around. My mind raced with possibilities. Had an animal somehow gotten trapped in the truck during our journey? Or was it something else? something that had been hiding there all along. The scratching intensified, accompanied now by a low, guttural sound that sent chills down my spine. Whatever was back there, it didn't sound friendly. I sat frozen in the driver's seat, my hands still on the door handle. As the noises from the truck bed grew more frantic, Whiskers let out a low growl, his fur standing on end as he pressed himself against the back of his carrier. The rational part of my brain told me to get out, to run to the safety of the cabin, but fear kept me rooted to the spot, unable to look away from the impenetrable darkness of the truck bed. I backed away from the truck as I clutched whiskers tightly in my arms. The rear door creaked open, agonizingly slowly, revealing a sight that made my blood run cold. Ethan stood there, but he was barely recognizable as the charming man I'd met earlier. His face was deathly pale, eyes wild and unfocused. In his hand, he gripped a wicked-looking ceremonial dagger, its blade glinting in the moonlight. The forest demands a sacrifice, he rasped, his voice barely human. We must appease the spirits. He lunged forward, the dagger slashing through the air. I stumbled backward, nearly losing my footing on the uneven ground. Whiskers hissed and spat in my arms, his claws digging into my skin. Ethan, stop, I cried, dodging another wild swing of the blade. This isn't you. But my words fell on deaf ears. Ethan's eyes were glazed over, unseeing as he advanced on me with single-minded purpose. The old ways must be honored, he ranted, his words tumbling out in a frenzied rush. Blood for the forest, flesh for the earth. I felt my back hit a tree trunk, realizing with horror that I had nowhere left to run. Ethan loomed over me, raising the dagger high. Please, I begged, my voice breaking, don't do this. For a moment I thought I saw a flicker of recognition in Ethan's eyes, but it was quickly swallowed by that manic gleam as he brought the dagger down in a vicious arc. I felt my muscles tense as Ethan slashed downward with the dagger. In that split second, whiskers. He launched himself from my arms with a ferocious yowl, claws extended as he flew at Ethan's face. The impact knocked Ethan off balance. He stumbled backward, the dagger slicing through empty air inches from my chest. I gasped, 
heart pounding as whiskers latched onto Ethan's head in a whirlwind of fur and claws. Get it off, Ethan screamed, his voice high with panic. He flailed wildly, trying to dislodge the enraged cat from his face. Blood streamed from deep scratches across Ethan's cheeks and forehead as Whiskers held on with grim determination. The dagger fell from Ethan's grip as he clawed at the cat with both hands. I watched in stunned disbelief as my one-eyed tabby fought like a demon to protect me. Whiskers was a blur of orange and white, hissing and spitting as his claws found purchase again and again. Ethan's screams turned to howls of agony. He stumbled in circles, hands still grasping futilely at whiskers. Blood poured from his face in rivulets, staining his shirt crimson. My eyes, he shrieked. Oh God, my eyes. I saw whiskers paw flash out, claws raking across Ethan's eyes. Ethan wailed, a sound of pure anguish that echoed through the trees. He dropped to his knees, hands clasped over his ruined face. Whiskers leapt clear as Ethan collapsed to the ground. My brave cat stood between us, fur bristling as he growled low in his throat. His one good eye gleamed with feral intensity in the moonlight. I stared in horrified amazement at the scene before me. Ethan lay curled in a fetal position, sobbing and whimpering as blood seeped between his fingers. The dagger lay forgotten in the dirt nearby. Whiskers turned to me, letting out a questioning chirp. Despite the terror of the moment, I felt a rush of gratitude and love for my loyal companion. He had saved my life without hesitation. Shaky, such a good, brave boy. In the distance, I heard the wail of approaching sirens. Someone must have heard the commotion and called for help. I sagged against the tree trunk, the adrenaline draining from my system as the immediate danger passed. Whiskers limped towards me, favoring his left front paw. I could see patches of fur missing and several bloody scratches marring his orange coat. My heart clenched at the sight of his injuries. I murmured, carefully scooping him into my arms. Let's get you inside and patched up. The wail of sirens grew louder as I stumbled towards the cabin, cradling whiskers in my arms. My hands shook as I fumbled with the key, finally managing to unlock the door and push it open. I rushed inside, kicking the door shut behind me. It's okay, buddy, I murmured, gently setting whiskers down on the worn sofa. You're safe now. We're safe. I flicked on the lights, wincing at the sudden brightness. I could see the full extent of whiskers' injuries. His orange and white fur was matted with blood, and angry red scratches crisscrossed his body. His left front paw was swollen, and he held it gingerly off the ground. Oh, whiskers, I choked out, tears welling in my eyes. You brave, stupid cat. I rummaged through the kitchen cabinet, searching for a first aid kit. My grandmother always kept one stocked, but in my panic, I couldn't remember where she stored it. I found it tucked away in a drawer beneath the sink. Returning to whiskers, I sat beside him on the sofa. He looked up at me with his one good eye, letting out a soft meow that broke my heart. I know it hurts, I said, my voice thick with emotion, but we need to clean you up, okay? I worked as gently as I could, using antiseptic wipes to clean his wounds. Whiskers flinched and hissed at the sting, but he didn't try to run away. He seemed to understand I was trying to help. You saved my life, I whispered as I worked, carefully applying antibiotic ointment to the worst of the scratches. I don't know how I can ever thank you enough. Whiskers purred softly, leaning into my touch despite his pain. I wrapped his swollen paw in a light bandage, hoping it wasn't broken. We'd need to see a vet as soon as possible, but for now, this would have to do. Outside, I heard car doors slamming and voices shouting. The police had arrived. I should go out and explain what happened, but I couldn't bring myself to leave Whiskers' side just yet. You're the best cat in the whole world. I told him, gently stroking his head, the bravest, most loyal friend anyone could ask for. Whiskers blinked slowly at me, then closed his eye. His breathing evened out as he drifted into an exhausted sleep. A sharp knock at the door made me jump. I cast one last glance at Whiskers, 
making sure he was comfortable before reluctantly standing to answer the door. As I walked across the room, I realized I was trembling all over. The events of the night crashed over me in a wave of delayed shock and fear. The following weeks unfolded like a nightmare I couldn't wake up from. Each day brought new horrors as the police uncovered more evidence of the ritualistic murders committed by Liam and Ethan. The quiet town I'd grown to love was suddenly thrust into the national spotlight, reporters swarming like vultures to pick over every gruesome detail. I sat in my living room, the TV droning on in the background as I absently stroked Whiskers' fur. He was still recovering from his injuries, but the vet assured me he'd make a full recovery. My brave, loyal cat. I don't know what I would have done without him. The police have made a shocking discovery in the case of the Forest Grove killings. I turned up the volume, my stomach churning with dread. Sources close to the investigation reveal that Evelyn Blackwood, known locally as Miss Blackwood, has been arrested in connection with the murders. Authorities believe she may have been the mastermind behind the killings. The remote slipped from my numb fingers, clattering to the floor. Miss Blackwood, the kindly old woman who ran the local bookstore, who always had a warm smile and a cup of tea ready for visitors. According to police, Miss Blackwood convinced her grandsons, Liam and Ethan Carter, that human sacrifices were necessary to lift a centuries-old curse on the forest. The brothers allegedly carried out the killings under her direction. I felt bile rise in my throat. How many times had I chatted with Miss Blackwood about local folklore and legends? Had she been planning these atrocities even then? The news continued, detailing the grisly discoveries made in the forest, bodies buried in shallow graves, makeshift altars stained with blood, arcane symbols carved into trees. Each new revelation sent a fresh wave of nausea through me. I thought of Ethan's wild eyes as he came at me with that dagger, the way he ranted about appeasing the forest spirits. It all made a horrifying kind of sense now. Whiskers nudged my hand, sensing my distress. I scooped him up, burying my face in his fur as tears began to fall. How could they do this? I whispered. How could anyone believe such terrible things? But there were no answers. Only the droning of the TV as it cycled through the same awful news over and over. Days passed in a haze. I barely left the house, jumping at every sound and flinching away from shadows. The forest that had once seemed so welcoming now loomed dark and threatening beyond my windows. Friends called, concerned about my withdrawal. I made excuses, not ready to face the outside world. How could I explain the nightmares that plagued me? The way I woke up gasping feeling phantom hands grasping at me in the dark. One afternoon, a knock at the door startled me from my brooding. I opened it to find Sheriff Miller standing on my porch, his face grave. Miss Thompson, he said, removing his hat. I hope I'm not intruding. I wanted to check in on you, see how you're holding up. I invited him in, grateful for the distraction from my own thoughts. We sat at the kitchen table, mugs of coffee growing cold between us as he filled me in on the latest developments. We've got Liam and Ethan in custody, he said. They're not talking much, but what they have said, well, it's disturbing to say the least. I nodded, unable to find words. Miss Blackwood, though, Sheriff Miller shook his head. She's something else entirely, cool as a cucumber. Even when confronted with evidence of the murders, keeps talking about ancient packs and forest spirits like they're the most natural thing in the world. A chill ran down my spine. Do you think she really believes it? Or is she just... I trailed off, not sure how to finish the thought. Sheriff Miller sighed heavily. Honestly, I don't know. The things we found in her house, books on occult rituals, journals detailing her communications with the forest spirits. It's like she was living in a whole different reality. We sat in silence for a long moment, the weight of it all pressing down on us. I know this has been hard on you, Sheriff Miller said gently. You are closer to all this than anyone. If you need to talk to someone, the department can arrange counseling. 
I nodded, grateful for the offer, even if I wasn't sure I was ready to take him up on it yet. As he stood to leave, Sheriff Miller paused. You should know you're being hailed as a hero in town. Standing up to Ethan like that, protecting your cat. It was brave. I shook my head. Whiskers is the real hero. I was just trying not to die. Sheriff Miller smiled. We'll give that cat of yours an extra treat from me. He's earned it. After he left, I sat at the table for a long time, turning over everything he'd said. The magnitude of what had happened, what had almost happened to me, felt overwhelming. Whiskers jumped up onto the table, butting his head against my hand. I scratched behind his ears, feeling a small smile tug at my lips for the first time in days. What do you say we order in tonight, buddy? I asked. I think we both deserve a little pampering. As I reached for my phone to call the local pizza place, I caught a glimpse of movement outside the window. For a heart-stopping moment, I thought I saw a figure standing at the edge of the forest. But when I looked again, there was nothing there but shadows and trees. I shook my head, trying to dispel the lingering fear. It would take time to feel safe again, to trust in the goodness of people and the peace of the forest. But with whiskers by my side and the support of the community, I knew I'd get there eventually. The sun had barely risen when I awoke to the sound of my phone buzzing incessantly. I groaned, reaching for it with bleary eyes. A flood of notifications lit up the screen, missed calls, text messages, and news alerts. Confused, I tapped on the most recent one. Local cat hailed as hero in Forest Grove Killings case. My eyes widened as I scrolled through the article. Somehow word had gotten out about Whiskers' role in saving me from Ethan. The story had gone viral overnight, spreading across social media and national news outlets. I glanced over at Whiskers, still curled up at the foot of my bed. He looked so peaceful, oblivious to his newfound fame. I couldn't help but smile, remembering how fiercely he had fought to protect me. Rise and shine, hero, I said softly, reaching out to stroke his fur. Whiskers opened his one good eye, letting out a sleepy chirp. As I got ready for the day, I kept the TV on in the background. Every channel seemed to be talking about whiskers, experts debating whether cats could be considered heroes, animal behaviorists analyzing his actions, even a segment on the rise of feline vigilantes. I shook my head, amused by the absurdity of it all. If only they knew Whiskers' usual daily routine consisted mostly of napping and demanding treats. A knock at the door startled me. I opened it to find a courier holding a large bouquet of flowers and a gift basket overflowing with gourmet cat treats. Delivery for Whiskers, he said, looking bemused. The, uh, hero cat? I thanked him, setting the gifts on the kitchen counter. The card attached red. To Asheville's bravest feline, Thank you for keeping our community safe. It was signed by the mayor. As the morning wore on, more deliveries arrived. Toys, cat beds, even a custom-made cat tree. My living room was starting to look like a feline amusement park. Whiskers, for his part, seemed utterly unimpressed by the attention. He sniffed at a few of the treats, but showed more interest in the cardboard boxes they came in. Around noon, my phone rang. It was the local news station, asking if they could come by for an interview. I hesitated. Not sure if I was ready to relive that night on camera, but then I thought about how Whiskers' story might bring some light to the darkness that had fallen over our town. All right, I agreed, but Whiskers gets final approval on all questions. The news van arrived an hour later. A perky reporter named Tiffany cooed over whiskers as the cameraman set up in my living room. I scooped up my reluctant star, settling him on my lap as we took our seats. Tiffany began, flashing a bright smile at the camera. Tell us about that night. What was going through your mind when whiskers leapt to your defense? I took a deep breath, stroking whiskers' fur to calm my nerves. Honestly, it all happened so fast. One moment I was terrified, certain I was about to die. The next, Whiskers was flying through the air like some kind of furry missile. Tiffany laughed. A furry missile of justice, it seems. 
And how is our hero recovering from his injuries? I glanced down at Whiskers, who had started purring contentedly in my lap. He's doing great. The vet says he'll make a full recovery. He's already back to his old habits of demanding treats and hogging the bed. As if on cue, Whiskers let out a loud meow. Tiffany's eyes lit up. Oh, it seems he has something to add. What would you say to all your adoring fans out there, Whiskers? Whiskers blinked slowly at the camera, then turned and began grooming himself. I couldn't help but laugh. I think that's his way of saying he's just happy to have done his part. The interview wrapped up shortly after. As the news van pulled away, I saw a small crowd had gathered outside. People were holding up signs with messages like, Whiskers for Mayor and Cats Against Crime. I closed the curtains, shaking my head in disbelief. How had this become my life? The rest of the day passed in a blur of phone calls and messages. Old friends reaching out to check on me. Strangers wanting to express their admiration for Whiskers by evening. I was exhausted. I flopped onto the couch Whiskers jumping up to join me on the TV. The local news was wrapping up their coverage of the day's events. And in a heartwarming conclusion to our top story, the anchor said we have footage of Whiskers returning home from the veterinary clinic earlier today. I sat up straighter surprised. I hadn't even known they'd been filming. The screen showed Whiskers in his carrier looking distinctly unimpressed as I carried him from the car to the house. A small crowd had gathered, cheering and waving as we passed. Someone threw a handful of catnip, which scattered across the walkway. I watched myself on screen, looking overwhelmed but managing a smile. Whiskers, true to form, ignored the commotion entirely. As the clip ended, I glanced down at the real Whiskers beside me. He was fast asleep, paws twitching slightly as he dreamed. You really don't care about any of this, do you? I murmured, scratching behind his ears. As long as you've got a warm lap and a full food bowl, you're happy. Whiskers cracked open his eye, letting out a soft purr before drifting off again. As night settled over Asheville, I found myself staring at the ceiling, unable to sleep. The events of the past few weeks played on an endless loop in my mind. I glanced at the clock, 11.43 p.m., with a sigh. I rolled onto my side, careful not to disturb Whiskers, who was curled up at the foot of the bed. Psst, Whiskers, I whispered. You awake? One green eye cracked open, regarding me with sleepy curiosity. I patted the space next to me on the pillow. Come here, buddy. I could use some company. Whiskers stretched languidly, his bandaged paw extended. He padded up the bed, settling into the crook of my arm with a contented purr. I buried my face in his soft fur, inhaling the familiar scent. You know, I murmured, I never thanked you properly for saving my life. I mean, sure, there's been all this attention and fancy cat food, but that's not really for you, is it? Whiskers blinked slowly in response, his purr deepening. I was thinking, I continued, running my fingers through his fur. Maybe it's time you got a permanent spot up here. What do you say? Want to be my official bed buddy? His purr intensified, and he kneaded my arm gently with his good paw. I took that as a resounding yes. I don't know how I would have gotten through all this without you, I admitted, my voice barely above a whisper. When I think about how close I came to, to... I trailed off, unable to finish the thought. Whiskers nudged my chin with his head as if sensing my distress. I scratched behind his ears, grateful for his unwavering support. A girl and her one-eyed wonder cat taking on the world, or at least taking on Asheville. Whiskers yawned widely, showing off his impressive set of teeth, the same teeth that had saved my life. I couldn't help but smile. All right, all right, I get the hint. Time for sleep, I said, settling deeper into the pillows. Good night, Whiskers. Sweet dreams, my brave boy. I felt my back hit a tree trunk, realizing with horror that I had nowhere left to run. 
Ethan loomed over me, raising the dagger high. Please, I begged, my voice breaking. Don't do this. For a moment I thought I saw a flicker of recognition in Ethan's eyes, but it was quickly swallowed by that manic gleam as he brought the dagger down in a vicious arc. I felt my muscles tense as Ethan slashed downward with the dagger. In that split second, whiskers. He launched himself from my arms with a ferocious yowl, claws extended as he flew at Ethan's face. The impact knocked Ethan off balance. He stumbled backward, the dagger slicing through empty air inches from my chest. I gasped, heart pounding as whiskers latched onto Ethan's head in a whirlwind of fur and claws. Get it off! Ethan screamed, his voice high with panic. He flailed wildly, trying to dislodge the enraged cat from his face. Blood streamed from deep scratches across Ethan's cheeks and forehead as whiskers held on with grim determination. The dagger fell from Ethan's grip as he clawed at the cat with both hands. I watched in stunned disbelief as my one-eyed tabby fought like a demon to protect me. Whiskers was a blur of orange and white, hissing and spitting as his claws found purchase again and again. Ethan's screams turned to howls of agony. He stumbled in circles, hands still grasping futilely at whiskers. Blood poured from his face in rivulets, staining his shirt crimson. My eyes, he shrieked. Oh God, my eyes! I saw Whiskers' paw flash out, claws raking across Ethan's eyes. Ethan wailed, a sound of pure anguish that echoed through the trees. He dropped to his knees, hands clasped over his ruined face. Whiskers leapt clear as Ethan collapsed to the ground. My brave cat stood between us, fur bristling as he growled low in his throat. His one good eye gleamed with feral intensity in the moonlight. I stared in horrified amazement at the scene before me. Ethan lay curled in a fetal position, sobbing and whimpering as blood seeped between his fingers. The dagger lay forgotten in the dirt nearby. Whiskers turned to me, letting out a questioning chirp. Despite the terror of the moment, I felt a rush of gratitude and love for my loyal companion. He had saved my life without hesitation. Shaky, such a good, brave boy. In the distance, I heard the wail of approaching sirens. Someone must have heard the commotion and called for help. I sagged against the tree trunk, the adrenaline draining from my system as the immediate danger passed. Whiskers limped towards me, favoring his left front paw. I could see patches of fur missing and several bloody scratches marring his orange coat. My heart clenched at the sight of his injuries. I murmured, carefully scooping him into my arms. Let's get you inside and patched up. The wail of sirens grew louder as I stumbled towards the cabin, cradling whiskers in my arms. My hands shook as I fumbled with the key, finally managing to unlock the door and push it open. I rushed inside, kicking the door shut behind me. It's okay, buddy, I murmured, gently setting whiskers down on the worn sofa. You're safe now. We're safe. I flicked on the lights, wincing at the sudden brightness. I could see the full extent of Whiskers' injuries. His orange and white fur was matted with blood, and angry red scratches crisscrossed his body. His left front paw was swollen, and he held it gingerly off the ground. Oh, Whiskers, I choked out, tears welling in my eyes. You brave, stupid cat. I rummaged through the kitchen cabinet, searching for a first aid kit. My grandmother always kept one stocked, but in my panic I couldn't remember where she stored it. I found it tucked away in a drawer beneath the sink. Returning to Whiskers, I sat beside him on the sofa. He looked up at me with his one good eye, letting out a soft meow that broke my heart. I know it hurts, I said, my voice thick with emotion, but we need to clean you up, okay? I worked as gently as I could, using antiseptic wipes to clean his wounds. Whiskers flinched and hissed at the sting, but he didn't try to run away. He seemed to understand I was trying to help. You saved my life, I whispered as I worked, carefully applying antibiotic ointment to the worst of the scratches. I don't know how I can ever thank you enough. Whiskers purred softly, leaning into my touch despite his pain. I wrapped his swollen paw in a light bandage, hoping it wasn't broken. We'd need to see a vet as soon as possible, but for now, this would have to do. 
Outside, I heard car doors slamming and voices shouting. The police had arrived. I should go out and explain what happened, but I couldn't bring myself to leave Whiskers' side just yet. You're the best cat in the whole world, I told him, gently stroking his head. The bravest, most loyal friend anyone could ask for. Whiskers blinked slowly at me, then closed his eye. His breathing evened out as he drifted into an exhausted sleep. A sharp knock at the door made me jump. I cast one last glance at Whiskers, making sure he was comfortable before reluctantly standing to answer the door. As I walked across the room, I realized I was trembling all over. The events of the night crashed over me in a wave of delayed shock and fear. The following weeks unfolded like a nightmare I couldn't wake up from. Each day brought new horrors as the police uncovered more evidence of the ritualistic murders committed by Liam and Ethan. The quiet town I'd grown to love was suddenly thrust into the national spotlight, reporters swarming like vultures to pick over every gruesome detail. I sat in my living room, the TV droning on in the background as I absently stroked Whisker's fur. He was still recovering from his injuries, but the vet assured me he'd make a full recovery. My brave, loyal cat. I don't know what I would have done without him. The police have made a shocking discovery in the case of the Forest Grove killings. I turned up the volume, my stomach churning with dread. Sources close to the investigation reveal that Evelyn Blackwood, known locally as Miss Blackwood, has been arrested in connection with the murders. Authorities believe she may have been the mastermind behind the killings. The remote slipped from my numb fingers, clattering to the floor. Miss Blackwood, the kindly old woman who ran the local bookstore, who always had a warm smile and a cup of tea ready for visitors. According to police, Miss Blackwood convinced her grandsons, Liam and Ethan Carter, that human sacrifices were necessary to lift a centuries-old curse on the forest. The brothers allegedly carried out the killings under her direction. I felt bile rise in my throat. How many times had I chatted with Miss Blackwood about local folklore and legends? Had she been planning these atrocities even then? The news continued, detailing the grisly discoveries made in the forest. Bodies buried in shallow graves, makeshift altars stained with blood, arcane symbols carved into trees. Each new revelation sent a fresh wave of nausea through me. I thought of Ethan's wild eyes as he came at me with that dagger, the way he ranted about appeasing the forest spirits. It all made a horrifying kind of sense now. Whiskers nudged my hand, sensing my distress. I scooped him up, burying my face in his fur as tears began to fall. How could they do this? I whispered. How could anyone believe such terrible things? But there were no answers. Only the droning of the TV as it cycled through the same awful news over and over. Days passed in a haze. I barely left the house, jumping at every sound and flinching away from shadows. The forest that had once seemed so welcoming now loomed dark and threatening beyond my windows. Friends called, concerned about my withdrawal. I made excuses, not ready to face the outside world. How could I explain the nightmares that plagued me? The way I woke up gasping feeling phantom hands grasping at me in the dark. One afternoon, a knock at the door startled me from my brooding. I opened it to find Sheriff Miller standing on my porch, his face grave. Miss Thompson, he said, removing his hat. I hope I'm not intruding. I wanted to check in on you, see how you're holding up. One with a sordid history that sent a chill down my spine. Indecent exposure, attempted kidnapping. My gut clenched as I traced his movements, watching as he vanished only to reappear across the country, a new identity, a new life, and a young girl he claimed as his own. I wrestled with the implications, the growing horror at what might have transpired under the guise of a normal family life. The pieces were falling into place. His life was a carefully constructed facade, his identity as fictitious as the alibis of the criminals I'd chased down in my earlier days on the force. The more I uncovered, the more I realized this wasn't just about a missing girl or an unidentified victim. 
It was about deception, about lives twisted by secrets so dark they were almost palpable. The breakthrough came when I matched the supposed father's social security number to a different name entirely, each one a revelation that painted a grim picture of the fate that had befallen Jane Doe. The realization hit me like a freight train. The man who had lived a lie, who had hidden in plain sight, was not just a kidnapper. He was a murderer. The timing of his sudden departure, the day before Jane Doe's body was found, was more than coincidence. It was a confession written in the shadows of his actions. But as the truth came into focus, so did the magnitude of the challenge ahead. How do you convict a ghost, a man whose very existence was a question mark, who had slipped through the cracks of society to commit unspeakable acts? I felt a responsibility, not just to Jane Doe, but to every silent victim whose cries for justice had gone unanswered. Yet as I sat in the dim light of my office, surrounded by the ghosts of the past, I knew that some truths came at a cost. Revealing the man behind the curtain would unravel not just his life, but the lives of those who had unknowingly been part of his deception. The weight of what lay ahead was daunting. It was a path lined with bureaucratic red tape and legal battles, a journey into the heart of darkness that promised no easy resolution. But as I looked back at the file on my desk, at the faceless woman who had become my charge, I knew there was no turning back. Justice, I had come to understand, it was not just about solving cases. It was about unraveling the lies that bound us, about shining a light into the darkest corners of the human soul. And so, with a deep breath, I stepped into the fray, determined to chase down the shadows, no matter where they led. The sun was setting over the horizon, casting long shadows across the Mississippi landscape as I leaned against the hood of my car, parked outside the old dusty office that had become my second home. The quiet of the evening was a stark contrast to the turmoil that churned within me, a reflection of the countless hours I'd spent wrestling with the cold case files that seemed to multiply with each passing day. The Jane Doe case had become a part of me, a constant companion in my thoughts. I had followed the trail as far as it would go, unraveling the complex web of lies that surrounded her untimely death. Yet, for all the progress I had made, I found myself at a standstill, facing the insurmountable barriers of bureaucracy and the limitations of the law. It was a bitter pill to swallow, the realization that justice was not always within reach, that some stories might never find their rightful ending. The frustration was palpable, a weight that pressed down on my shoulders, a reminder of the imperfect world we live in. But amidst the disappointment, there was also a sense of resolve. I had delved into the depths of humanity's darkest moments, and I had emerged with a deeper understanding of the resilience of the human spirit. The cases I had worked on, the lives I had touched, they had left an indelible mark on me, shaping the person I had become. I thought of the families I had met along the way, the faces of those who had lost loved ones to the cruel hand of fate. Their stories were a testament to the enduring hope that drives us forward, the belief that even in the face of overwhelming odds, there is always a chance for redemption. As the last light of day faded into the twilight, I knew that my time with the cold case unit was drawing to a close. The years had taken their toll, and I felt the pull of a quieter life, one far removed from the chaos and heartache that had become my daily bread. But as I prepared to step away, to pass the torch to those who would follow in my footsteps, I couldn't help but feel a sense of pride. We had fought the good fight, pushed back against the darkness, and in our own way, made a difference. Jane Doe and all the others like her would forever be a part of me, a reminder of the journey I had undertaken. Their stories, though unfinished, would continue to inspire, to serve as a beacon of hope in a world that so often seemed devoid of it. In the end, I realized that justice was not just about the cases we solved or the criminals we brought to book. It was about the lives we touched, the difference we made 
even in the smallest of ways. And as I looked out over the landscape that had been the backdrop to my career, I knew that in some small corner of the world, we had left it a little better than we had found it. The road ahead was uncertain, but I faced it with a sense of peace, knowing that even in the shadows, there was always a glimmer of light, a flicker of hope, and for now, that was enough. As I sit here recounting the events of that fateful night, I can't help but reflect on the journey that led me to that moment. My name is Maria, and I'm what some might call a non-traditional student. At 35, with two children and a loving husband, I decided to pursue my lifelong dream of becoming a nurse. The decision wasn't easy. Balancing family life, work, and studies is a challenge that often feels insurmountable. But there I was, driving home after an evening class midterm, my mind still buzzing with medical terminologies and procedures we'd covered in the exam. The night was crisp, a typical autumn evening in our small Midwestern town. The roads were nearly empty, save for the occasional passing car. I'd taken this route countless times, but tonight, something felt different. The air seemed charged with an energy I couldn't quite explain. As I approached the intersection on Willow Creek Road, a rarely used stretch that cut through dense woods, I began to slow down. It was then that I noticed something unusual in the sky to my right. At first I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. After all, I was tired from the exam and the late hour. But as I focused, I realized what I was seeing was real. Two moving lights, approximately 300 feet above the ground. These weren't your typical aircraft lights. They moved with a fluidity that defied explanation slowly traversing the night sky like celestial dancers. As I watched, transfixed, the lights came to a stop about 150 feet directly in front of my car. I remember thinking, this can't be happening, but it was. And what happened next only added to the surreal nature of the experience. Three more lights appeared, seemingly out of nowhere. One by one, they lined up with the other two, forming a perfect row of five illuminated objects hovering silently above the road. Instinctively, I stopped the car. My heart was racing, a mix of fear and excitement coursing through my veins. I reached over and locked the doors, though in retrospect, I'm not sure what protection I thought that would offer against whatever was happening in the sky above me. Time seemed to stand still as I sat there, my eyes glued to the otherworldly display above. The lights hovered, completely motionless, yet somehow alive with energy. I couldn't tell if they were blinking or rotating. It was as if they were part of a round object spinning in place. The silence was the most unnerving part. Living in a rural area, I was used to the quiet of night, but this was different. It was as if the very air had been sucked out of the world leaving nothing but these five mysterious lights in me. I don't know how long I sat there, mesmerized by the sight. It could have been minutes or hours. All I know is that when the lights finally moved, it happened so fast I almost missed it. One by one, they took off at a speed I've never seen before or since. Each light followed the other in perfect formation, streaking across the sky faster than any aircraft I'd ever encountered. In a matter of seconds, they were gone, leaving me alone on the dark, empty road. As the last light disappeared from view, I felt a wave of disorientation wash over me. I reached for the key to start the car, only to realize it was already running. Stranger still, I noticed the doors were unlocked. I frowned, trying to remember if I had unlocked them. But my memory was hazy, clouded by the adrenaline and excitement of what I'd just witnessed. I chalked it up to a lapse in attention. After all, I just experienced something extraordinary. The drive home was a blur. My mind raced with questions, theories, and doubts. Had I really seen what I thought I saw? Or was my tired brain playing elaborate tricks on me? As I pulled into our driveway, 
I glanced at the clock on the dashboard. It read 11.45 p.m. I did a double take, sure there must be some mistake. I'd left the college just after 8.30 p.m., and the drive home usually took no more than 20 minutes. I walked into the house expecting to find my husband, Tom, already in bed. Instead, he was pacing in the living room, a worried expression etched on his face. Maria, he exclaimed as I entered. Where have you been? I've been trying to call you for hours. I stared at him, confused. What do you mean? I left right after the exam. I should be early, if anything. Tom's frown deepened. Early? Maria, it's almost midnight. You're nearly three hours late. The realization hit me like a physical blow. Three hours? How was that possible? I recounted my drive home, the strange lights in the sky. But even as I spoke, I knew it couldn't account for all that lost time. Tom listened patiently, his expression a mix of concern and skepticism. When I finished, he gently suggested that perhaps I dozed off in the car, my mind creating an elaborate dream to fill the gap. But I knew what I'd seen. The lights, the silence, the impossible speed. It had all been real, hadn't it? In the days and weeks that followed, I found myself obsessed with finding an explanation for what had happened that night. I scoured local news reports, hoping to find some mention of unusual lights in the sky. I even reached out to the local air traffic control, asking if they'd recorded any strange phenomena. My search yielded nothing concrete. A few people reported seeing something odd in the sky that night, but their accounts were vague and inconsistent. The more I dug, the more questions I uncovered. What were those lights? Why couldn't I account for those missing hours? And why did I have such a vivid memory of an event that seemingly lasted only a few minutes? My studies at nursing school took a back seat to my new obsession. I spent countless hours researching UFO sightings, abduction stories, and scientific explanations for seemingly paranormal events. Some of what I found resonated with my experience, while other accounts seemed far-fetched, even compared to what I'd witnessed. Tom tried to be supportive, but I could see the worry in his eyes. He gently suggested that perhaps I should talk to someone, a therapist or counselor who could help me process what had happened, but I was adamant. I knew what I'd seen, and I was determined to find out the truth. It was during one of my late night internet searches that I stumbled upon a local support group for people who had experienced unexplained phenomena. At first I was skeptical. The idea of sitting in a circle sharing stories that most people would dismiss as fantasy or delusion didn't appeal to me. But as the weeks passed and my obsession grew, I found myself drawn to the idea of talking to others who might understand. People who wouldn't look at me with pity or concern when I recounted my story. The first meeting was held in the basement of a local church. As I walked down the stairs, I could hear the low murmur of voices. I paused at the door, suddenly unsure. Was I really going to do this? Taking a deep breath, I pushed open the door. The room fell silent as all eyes turned to me. There were about a dozen people seated in a circle, their expressions a mix of curiosity and understanding. A woman with kind eyes and graying hair stood up. Welcome, she said warmly. I'm Linda. We're glad you could join us. Would you like to introduce yourself? I hesitated for a moment before taking a seat. I'm Maria, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. And I, I saw something I can't explain. As I recounted my story to the group, I was struck by the attentiveness of their faces. There was no judgment, no skepticism, just genuine interest and empathy. When I finished, a man named David leaned forward. The lights you saw, he said, his voice trembling slightly. Were they a sort of pulsating blue-white? I nodded, stunned. Yes, exactly like that. How did you know? David's story was remarkably similar to mine. He'd seen the lights while camping in the woods about 50 miles from where I'd had my encounter. Like me, he'd experienced missing time and a sense of disorientation afterward. Others in the group shared their own experiences. 
While the details varied, there were common threads, unexplained lights, missing time, and a profound sense that something life-changing had occurred. For the first time since that night, I felt a sense of validation. These people believed me because they'd lived through similar experiences. They understood the frustration of not having answers, the feeling of being dismissed by friends and family who couldn't comprehend what we'd been through. As the meeting drew to a close, Linda approached me. How are you feeling? She asked gently. I thought for a moment before answering. Relieved, I said finally. And less alone. Linda nodded understandingly. That's why we're here. To remind each other that we're not crazy and we're not alone. Emboldened by my experience with the support group, I decided to take my investigation to the next level. With the help of David and a few others from the group, we began to piece together a timeline of sightings in our area. We created a map, marking each location where strange lights had been reported. As we worked, a pattern began to emerge. The sighting seemed to follow a rough line, moving from the southwest to the northeast over the course of several months. Our investigation didn't stop there. We reached out to local astronomers, meteorologists, and even military officials, seeking any explanation for what we'd seen. Most were dismissive, offering explanations ranging from weather balloons to experimental aircraft, but a few were more open-minded. An astronomy professor from the local university agreed to meet with us. While he couldn't offer a definitive explanation, he did provide us with tools to better document any future sightings. Armed with this new knowledge, we set up a network of observers. If anyone in the group spotted anything unusual, they were to contact the others immediately. We were determined to gather concrete evidence of whatever it was we'd encountered. Months passed, and while our enthusiasm never waned, the sightings became less frequent. Life began to return to normal. I refocused on my nursing studies, determined to complete my degree despite the distractions of the past year. It was a crisp autumn evening, almost exactly a year after my initial encounter, when it happened again. I was driving home from a late night study session at the library when I saw them, the familiar blue-white lights hovering in the distance. My heart raced as I pulled over to the side of the road. With shaking hands, I reached for the camera we'd all agreed to keep in our cars for just such an occasion. As I watched through the viewfinder, the lights began to move. They danced across the sky in intricate patterns, defying the laws of physics as I understood them. I snapped photo after photo, praying that at least one would come out clearly. Suddenly, the lights shot upward at an impossible speed, disappearing into the night sky. I sat there for a long moment, my breath coming in short gasps, before I remembered to call the others. The photos I took that night weren't perfect. Many were blurry or underexposed. But a few, a precious few, clearly showed the lights, their ethereal glow captured for all to see. Our group was ecstatic. Finally, we had tangible evidence of what we'd been experiencing. We carefully analyzed each photo looking for any clue that might help us understand what we were seeing. We sent copies to experts around the country, ufologists, astronomers, even government agencies. The responses were mixed. Some dismissed the photos as easily explainable phenomena or clever hoaxes. Others were more intrigued, asking for more information and offering to conduct further analysis. As word of our evidence spread, we found ourselves thrust into the spotlight. Local news stations wanted interviews, and we even received inquiries from national media outlets. It was overwhelming and, at times, frightening. We had sought answers, but now we found ourselves at the center of a growing controversy. As the media frenzy grew, I found myself at a crossroads. The attention was taking a toll on my family life and my studies. Tom, who had been supportive if skeptical, was now openly worried about the impact this was having on our lives. Maria, he said one night, his voice gentle but firm. You need to decide what's more important, 
chasing these lights or building the future we've always dreamed of. I knew he was right. The investigation had consumed my life for the past year. While I'd managed to keep up with my studies, I knew I wasn't giving them the attention they deserved. And my children, had I been as present for them as I should have been? That night I sat alone in our backyard gazing up at the stars. The same stars that had held such mystery and promise a year ago now seemed to be asking me a question. What do you really want? As I sat there, I realized that while the mystery of the light still burned within me, it couldn't be the center of my life. I had responsibilities to my family, to my future patients, to myself. The decision to step back from the investigation wasn't easy, but I knew it was right. I explained my choice to the group, and while some were disappointed, most understood. They had their own lives, their own responsibilities to consider. I didn't abandon my belief in what I'd seen. How could I, when the memory was still so vivid? But I chose to carry it with me as a private truth, a reminder that the universe is far more mysterious and wonderful than we often allow ourselves to believe. I threw myself back into my studies with renewed vigor. The experience had changed me, making me more open to possibilities beyond the textbook explanations. I found that this openness made me a better student and eventually a better nurse. There were times, especially on clear nights, when I'd find myself scanning the sky, half hoping and half fearing to see those lights again. But they never returned, at least not for me. Years have passed since that night when the sky danced for me. I'm a registered nurse now, working in the ER of our local hospital. The skills I use every day are grounded in science and proven medical practices. Yet, there's a part of me that remains open to the inexplicable. Sometimes, when a patient tells me about an experience that defies conventional explanation, I listen with an open mind. I don't share my own story that remains a private part of my life. But I offer them the understanding and validation that I once so desperately sought. The mystery of what I saw that night remains unsolved. Perhaps it always will be. But I've come to realize that not all questions need answers. Sometimes the experience itself, the wonder, the mystery, the opening of one's mind to greater possibilities is enough. As I write these words, I can look out my window and see the night sky, vast and full of secrets. And I smile, knowing that somewhere out there, the lights might be dancing for someone else, changing their life as profoundly as they changed mine.